Welcome to the Bout and Blitz SEC edition. I'm Joe Lisi, joined by former National Coach of the Year, Terry Bowden. Coach, a huge slate in the SEC in terms of week number eight. We're going to preview those games in just a little bit, but we're going to turn back the clock. Three great games to go through, including the near upset by South Carolina over Jalen Milrow and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama opened as a 21 and a half point home favorite. They were pushed to the limit. Alabama prevails 27-25, but that was a little too close of a call for Kalen DeBoer and the crew. You know, and I'll say this again. I said about some of the South Carolina's got a good football team. They've had a very poor game when against Kentucky early, I think, but they have played very good football, lost some, lost some tight ball games. And their head coach, uh, uh, Coach Beamer, he he said, we, we are, we're a good football team. And we and we mm-hmm. take a good football team in, but they were playing against a good football team. And Alabama has just been to me has been inconsistent on defense. They ought to play an old fashioned Alabama defense, whether it be Bear Bryant or Nick Saban, ones I grew up with, where they go out there and every week, week in and week out, it's going to be hard to move the football. Alabama's been hot and cold on their defense. They've got to get that to where they can play four quarters over there. Uh, and South Carolina was just good enough to to challenge them all the way down to the wire. It's almost about, if you think about it, right, 10 quarters of football. It started in the 41-34 to win over Georgia. The second half, Georgia moved the, moved the football at will. We knew what uh, Vanderbilt did in, in regards to that matchup, 40-35. to And this was a, a basically a one-dimensional offense in South Carolina that was handcuffed a week prior by Ole Miss and lost home at home in Williams-Brice as a 9.5-point home dog. 24 to 3. I mean, to make Lenora Sellers and that offense look dynamic, something needs to change this coming Saturday against Tennessee and that offense, no? Yeah, let me go back and say this. Some teams match up better against other teams. And for some reason, South Carolina did not match up well against Ole Miss because they played better than that in even the other games they lost. But it's going to be a big game in Alabama. We, and they're going to have to pick up their game. They're going to have to pick mm-hmm. up their game. We start talking about that game next, this week coming up because you can't play – one side of football and be a national championship contender. And we don't talk about this much, but remember all those fannies up in that stands at Alabama, they're not interested, but one thing, national championship, are you getting us there? And right now they're a little worried because their team, even when they win, they don't dominate. Yeah. Jalen Milrow, 209 yards, did have the big touchdown with about two minutes left to really put Alabama up by eight points, but South Carolina was knocking on the door. They recovered the onside kick had a potential game-winning field goal attempt, couldn't get it done uh, against Alabama, and now they move on. They're a two-and-a-half-point road favorite right now on multiple sports books against the Tennessee Volunteers. We'll break down that game in next segment. Another dynamic uh, atmosphere took place in Neyland Stadium. Tennessee was a 14-and-a-half-point home favorite over Florida. Florida had won seven of the last eight, including last year in the series against Tennessee. They brought their A game. They dominated for a half. It, the game went right down to the wire, and Tennessee stole it, got the win and no cover over the Gators 23-17. to 17. But I'll say this. Their quarterback is very inconsistent. Nico, the rushing attack hasn't been the same over the past three weeks. Things need to change because in order to beat Alabama this weekend, they're going to have to score at least 24 points in that matchup. Now, I'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to that Tennessee-Alabama game, but this isn't a Josh Heupel offense. Something it's something about Nico is that they're playing to protect him. Something mm-hmm. about whether it's an accuracy mm-hmm. or they're fear that he'll make mistakes because this isn't the Tennessee of old. This isn't the Tennessee style of play that got Josh Heupel the ball. Remember two years ago when they couldn't stop from scoring? This isn't what he – he cut his teeth on the wide open offense, and right now he's playing defense, ball control, and win a close ball game. And that's not his style, but they're doing it. And I'm afraid there's some things we maybe not know about accuracy or judgment about this young quarterback that they feel he's not quite ready. And I'll tell you something, Alabama's got one of the most ready quarterbacks in the country in Alabama. It definitely, Nico threw for 169 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. You saw Tennessee convert four of 15 on third downs. That needs to change this weekend. And that wasn't an elite Florida defense. Florida has given up some points over the past few weeks. So to see Florida dominate, especially on the road, 
that was definitely a cause of concern. The game of the night, though, might have happened in Death Valley. We talked about it uh, in the breakdown. It was the 100th year anniversary for LSU. LSU had do dominated the series. Uh, Ole Miss hadn't won in Baton Rouge since 2008. They had basically uh, a three-and-a-half-quarter lead against Garrett Nussmeyer and LSU. They find a way, though, in overtime to strike the upset as a three-and-a-half-point home dog, 29-26. Give me your thoughts about what transpired in Death Valley last Saturday night. Well, you know, two two great quarterbacks, and I think Nussmeyer came back and made the best plays at the end of the game. When I watched the game, I just felt like uh, Ole Miss – was winning. They won about 58 minutes out of 60 of the football game, but they lost in overtime because uh, Garrett Nussmeyer made a beautiful throw for a touchdown. And again, both of them good quarterbacks, but I think LSU has a strong quarterback. They played a solid football game all around, but the fact is Ole Miss had a chance to put them away several times and didn't do it. And then and LSU kind of hung around. And what happened, that crowd, a hundred and something thousand, I mean, a hundred year anniversary of their stadium, it did make an impact. I saw a legal procedure late in the game that would probably not come without that noise. And so LSU, by staying close, by the time it got to the overtime part of the game, it was so loud, it's hard to function in that stadium. So big X factor game there. I said before the game, that stadium is going to be a difference in this ball game. And the way Ole Miss played and played a little bit better, but LSU hung on to one at the end. You have to think that that crowd had something to do with it. They did. They were definitely a factor. I've been very impressed with Blake Baker and the defense as well. We'll break it down when we talk about the Arkansas game this coming Saturday. Big picture, though. I feel like not a lot of people talking about Brian Kelly at LSU based off of what you saw performance-wise. I know they play a lot of close games up until this point. Can they compete for a college football playoff appearance? Well, you know, they, they threw 50 times. They didn't run the ball quite well enough. And, and uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they're going to have to win a lot of close ball games. They're not my favorite pick, but I've, I said before the season, I think this chance, this team was my sleeper in the SEC to get to the college football playoff, uh, possibly to the conference championship. And I know they lost to Southern Cal in a game that they feel like they could have won if they just played their best football, but they're undefeated in the conference. They've won five straight. Uh, and they have enough talent and a super quarterback because many people pick Nussmeyer to go fairly high in the draft uh, because of the skill that he has and the size that he has, even though they don't always, they have not always thrown the ball with him. I think the fact he threw it 50 times and they continue to win, uh, it keeps him in that Heisman look. Uh, and as just like some of the other quarterbacks like a Klubnik, the more you win and the more you win towards the end, if you get to that conference championship, that quarterback is key. I really think when it gets late in the season, I always looked who has the most veteran quarterback, the quarterback that has the most experience in tough football games. He threw some interceptions, but he battled back. He's got great pocket presence. He's a coach's son, to your point, and completion-wise only completed 47% of his passes Saturday night, but did throw for 337 yards in that, hit two big touchdowns, the fourth down to get it into overtime, and then knocking in with Kyron Lacey. I agree with you. I think it's important, too, even though we're in an expanded playoff, the fact that that week one loss – happened then right in august the first week of the season against usc that's a that's a big deal for lsu they can erase that move forward maybe they're not the same team and even though they're playing with close games they still have an opportunity to get to a playoff well and again the the Nussmeyer has the ability to hit deep plays that's one of the reasons he didn't have a high completion right they threw a lot of vertical passes they took big chunk plays but the fact that they can score explosive plays is going to be important because when you're not the best team overall if you can hit explosive plays and don't turn the ball over you got a chance to beat about anybody when coach and i come back we'll break down the battle in austin bulldogs and longhorns coming up next
Back on the Bowden Blitz SEC edition, Joe Lisi and head coach Terry Bowden breaking down week number eight in the conference. There might not be a bigger game than the one that in Austin this coming Saturday, Texas, number one ranked Texas and number five ranked Georgia square off. It's a 730 kick coach in the offseason. The Bulldogs were one and a half point favorites. Fast forward to week number eight. The Bulldogs are now underdogs by three and a half points. Texas dominated Oklahoma in the Red River rivalry. They got the winning cover by 14 and a half points. Georgia struggled yet again in back-to-back weeks against Mississippi State. How do you see this game playing out? Well, I mean, Texas is the one team in the, in the nation now that Ohio State got knocked off that really, with talent, has played uh, – dominantly in every ball game. They, they've not been in question in any ball game. And so the way they play each week and the way they use two quarterbacks and the way they come out ready to play and they control their opponent and win the football games, I just think they are the best team in the in the country right now the way they're playing. But I'm not so quick to get off of Georgia. They've won so much. Their talent is so high. And Kirby Smart, is has been a he's been in these situations a little bit more as the head coach, and he'll have his team ready. I have this gut feeling that Georgia, in this game, this is going to be the game where they, they put a little bit more together, their quarterback and their defense play, and I'm thinking Georgia's going to play their best game of the year, and this one's maybe even going Georgia's favor. I agree with that, Coach, and I do want to take a look at the Georgia side. We mentioned they lost three weeks ago to Alabama. Mm -hmm. They were laying one and a half points in in that matchup. They did have the fourth quarter lead, 34 to 33, allowed the big play over the top to Ryan Williams, and we're still in a position in the final minute to at least tie the game or, or send it into overtime, and Carson Beck throws the interception, but how important was it to play in that game? I know that Texas played on the road against Michigan, but that's still a one-dimensional offense with the Wolverines. They weren't really scoring a lot uh, heading into that matchup. They were more methodical, relied on the rushing attack, so they weren't really pushed the Texas secondary by a quarterback like Carson Beck. So how important was it to have that game already under your belt for the Georgia Bulldogs and coupled with the fact that Georgia is a dominant road team dating back since 2022 they're 17 and 2 on the road or on a neutral field that has to be a, a, a really good recipe heading into this matchup in Austin well you know and I'll say this whether you're home or away if you got better talent than the other guys you're probably going to win but they're going on the road to a team that has as much or more talent. I'm not sure if you say who has the best running backs, who has the best wide receivers, who has, if you went right on down the line, it'd be tough to pick which team has the best athletes at every position. So they're going to face somebody just as good as they are. But I think they learned something in that Alabama loss that they had. You know, that I think Alabama had a better game plan. All their scores were right to the sideline. If you remember, they ran to the sideline, they saw something in the offseason, they did something different. Then, then Georgia uh, responded and made adjustments at halftime and shut that down. So I think Georgia now has got their self going. They're not dominating people, but I still think they know how to play for a championship and they know how to be a championship team. And being an old football coach, I'm always watching what's coming out of the coaches and how they are, have been in the past, what their experience level is. Because in the SEC, as you get down toward the end of the season, Every game is critical, and you'd have to say this one is a do-or-die for Georgia because if they lose this one, then everywhere down the road, every game a, is a is a final game. If you, you lose the third one, you got a chance of not even making the playoffs. So this is a big game for Georgia. Texas could actually lose this game and still play for the championship or get in the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll break down Texas in just a second. Last thing's on Georgia. They're averaging 134 rushing yards per game, throwing for well over 300 with Carson Beck, but when you look at the offense last year, Georgia was averaging 191 rushing yards against opposing defenses. Over the past couple of years, they're 12-0. and uh, every time they rush for over 200 yards, have won those games by an average margin of victory of 28-plus per game. Last year, they won by 30 points per game. Two years ago, it was 27.8 points per game. I bring that up because this year, through week number eight, at least heading into it, they don't have a performance where they've pounded the rock for over 200 yards. And if you want to date back to 2016, they're 49-0 and every time they rush for over 200 against FBS and FCS opponents. How important is to the ability to run the football in order for them to pull out the victory? 
Well, yeah, and I think you got to get you have a defense that goes with it because you got to get get the other team off the field, and they've given up. They've they've allowed some teams to stay on the field as well, and you're less likely to run it quite as much when you wonder how long will it be before I get back on the field, and that's not a lot. It's not like they have a bad defense. That's just you're talking about some premier defenses they've had there in the last two or three years. So they would like to run the football, but I think that goes hand in hand with their defense. If your defense is dominating, I mean, you can run that football even when you got tough run situations and stay with it a little longer. Uh, when you get behind or you feel like you got to score, all of a sudden it's not that you can't run, it's that you can't, you don't have time to. You want to throw the football. So, again, I don't think they're explosive enough. I'm with you. They've got to get that running game going and pound it, and that defense has got to get Texas. Can they get Texas off the field? Because Texas has got athletes running all over the place on their offense. And I think nothing's interesting to both of these teams. You know, their offensive lines are both – all of them were recruited out of high school, except for one that was recruited the year before. That. They, they, they developed these people, and they both have pretty good, good offensive lines. When you look at Texas right now, averaging 43 points per game, they put up 177 rushing yards in the win against Oklahoma. Quinn Ewers was good, but not elite. 199 yards through the air, one touchdown, one interception. Any effects from the abdominal strain? And more importantly, he's not as mobile as Jalen Milrow. That gave the Georgia defense fits in the first half of that matchup. Is The fact that yours is more prototypical drop back does that benefit the Georgia defense or more that Texas has the lethal passing attack? Well, I, th- I think it, it'll probably benefit the defense a good bit uh, and give them a better chance to do what they want to do defensively. If you look at how it plays out, it gives them a chance to, to really decide and adjust and make the offense adapt to them where they can know what the offense is doing. It's always nice if you know you got a guy in the pocket. Well, we'll see what happens. Isaiah Bond could be a playmaker. Remember, played his days in Alabama last year. Now, one of the most elite, prolific wide receivers for the Texas offense. We'll see if they can utilize him in fly sweeps and, more importantly, in the passing attack with Quinn Yours. Texas averaging well over 180 rushing yards per game. When Coach and I return, we'll talk about the two other big games in the conference, Bama, Tennessee, and LSU, Arkansas, coming up next. Back on the Bowden Blitz, going to preview the next two biggest games in the conference, LSU and Arkansas, Alabama and Tennessee. But, Coach, I did know that you wanted to talk about Quinn Ewers, whether he's healthy, the fact that he's a prototypical dropback passer, how that potentially could be a benefit to the Georgia defense, especially in critical third downs if he's not 100% healed from that injury a couple of weeks ago. And I don't think it's necessarily a a bad thing that you're a pocket passer. You'll see half the NFL teams are still mostly pocket passers. The key is every now and then you got to roll to the right, roll to the left, just to to change the the contact point where the defense is always heading to the same place. If you never get out of that pocket, that defense knows four or five yards behind the center. That's where you got to get to no matter what happens. And when you roll them just a little bit, you can take advantage of moving the pocket because when you got a quarterback like yours, and even Manning to some extent, he can run, but they're both pocket passers. And I think you've got to move it just a little bit. Now, Milrow, I think that's why so many NFL teams are going to a moving quarterback because it's so dynamic and they can run and hurt you or they can throw and hurt you. And that's why you see so many teams that you would not have thought, of, especially in the NFL, taking these quarterbacks out of college that can pr- that run pretty good as well as throw. And speaking of Jalen Milrow, the Georgia defense did make adjustments in the second half of that matchup. Milrow ended the game with about 36 yards in that performance. They still won it 41 to 34. Jalen Milrow now is on the road this coming Saturday. It's going to be a crazy atmosphere in Neyland Stadium. Alabama opened as a three-point favorite. It's down to two and a half on multiple books. You talk about the series perspective, Coach. Alabama's won 16 of the last 17 meetings against Tennessee. They won last year 34-20 to as an eight-and-a-half-point home favorite. 
in Tuscaloosa, but the last time they played in Neyland Stadium, they lost 52 to 49. That was Hendon Hooker and Jalen Hyatt breaking out for a dynamic performance. Tennessee is going to be up for this matchup, but can they strike the upset over Alabama this Saturday? Well, there, there's just a couple of unknowns that I can't really have a good feel for this football game because can Tennessee play like that team that lost, that won, what, 52 to 49? Or are they going to play like they have been playing this year or they can get close to it? Because I think that's where Tennessee could get back to being a championship contender. Then Alabama, I think that was not a good day for Alabama back then, but they got to play consistent defense this Saturday. Because I think if I'm Alabama, you, you got to be open for the possibility wide open. But I'm thinking you got to stuff what they're doing. And right now, Tennessee's trying to control the football, run the football. And I think Alabama's got to play good full quarter. So it's the question is, how is Nico and Tennessee's offense going to play? And how, how consistent will Alabama's defense play? Those are the real X factors or unknowns in this football game. The, the, uh, the question of the week regarding Tennessee has been the rushing attack. They're averaging 246 yards on the ground per game. But if you look from those games against FCS opponents, Chattanooga, and where they were putting up 60 and 70 points respectively against Kent State, the rushing yards per, per attempt and per carry have consistently gone down 2.9, 4.0. They haven't been over five yards in three straight weeks per carry. Is that a cause of concern to potentially strike the upset, or is it just maybe Josh Heupel going a little bit vanilla over the past few weeks? You know, when after the 22 season when they scored all the points, I studied their offense for six months. I studied everything they did. Even when they run for so much early in the season, they're still a pass-first, run-second team. And I say that not because they're passing first, but because their reputation for passing is so big and they line up in passing formations, they don't have to pass. Right? They can run right off the bat, and that's what happened this season. But as other teams began to see that they were not going deep, that they were not per vertically passing, they began to tighten up and tighten up. And now, because you don't threaten on the edge or vertically downfield, they're able to stuff the run. So you got to be careful. I don't think you start off run, run, run just to improve the run. You better hurt people vertically down the field or, or horizontally to the sideline to spread those safeties out, to spread those outside linebackers out. So you've got good numbers in the box. That and Because they're only play Tennessee basically runs is an inside zone play. So you got to spread them out. So, yes, they need to run uh, successfully. But that only happens if the defenses fear your passing game. Right now, I don't think people fear Tennessee's passing games. I like Alabama to win and cover this line. I think they can win it by a touchdown because of Jalen Milrow, and we'll see how that game plays out. High total, 56 and a half. Quickly, LSU and Arkansas. LSU's won seven of the last eight. They're laying two and a half on the road. Arkansas out of a bye week. I'll roll with LSU, coach. No, I'm, I'm staying with them. I've been with them since the beginning of the season. But this Arkansas team, I think, is very, very good. They, they, they are. They probably saved Sam Pittman's job the way they're playing, and they still could continue to win. I think they have just one in conference loss, so they're still in that theoretical hunt. But Arkansas, to me, is like some of these teams that we've seen that the men is just a great football team. Uh, Georgia Tech, some of these other teams like that, they're a lot better teams. But there's going to be a struggle for our team. If they're going to win, if they're going to win it at the end. And they're going to we'll see you next week on the Bowden Blitz. Have a great weekend, everyone.